Hello, this is Matthew Baldwin, Professor of Religion at Mars Hill University, and I am here joined today on episode three of Ideas of Jesus video podcast with a special guest, Sarah Parks, who is an early career researcher at the University of Nottingham, former assistant professor at the University of Nottingham. And Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for sharing your Friday evening with us. Yes, that's right. It's it's evening here in Nottingham, Friday yeah. night. I'm very happy to be here with you. Oh, that's great. And we're so looking forward. We're going to talk today about uh, Sarah's research into, well, the title of your book is Gender in the Rhetoric of Jesus, Women in Q. And I have here a screenshot of it. It's from uh, Lexington Fortress Press. There it is. Gender in the there Rhetoric of Women in Q by Sarah Parks. And this, this photo, I took it in Pompeii. It's a first century uh, mosaic of a man and a woman. Fantastic. <laughs> so I have all kinds of things that I want to talk with you about today. And um, my audience, you asked before about the audience of this podcast. We don't know for sure who watches our video podcasts, but uh, my students are invited to watch it. And we're aiming at an audience of people who are interested in scholarship on Jesus and critical ideas about Jesus, but may not be that familiar with the work of biblical scholars or uh, the kind of things that we do. And so I bet the first question that many of my audience might want to ask you, and that I'd like to ask you is, uh, what do you mean by Q? And, uh, right, and what are we talking right. about here? Yes, yeah, because the subtitle of my book is Women in Q. Women in um, and Q. notice that the publisher actually made me put that part quite small. I think that's wrong. And they, I thought so too. I argued back a little bit, but then I said, okay, you, you folks know best. So, well, we will, um, I, I'll say, I want to say real quick that rhetoric of Jesus, that sells books, right? People want to know about what Jesus said. Jesus sells. He's yeah. been, he's been a popular guy ever since, you know, the year 20. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, he's never stopped. It's true. Yeah. What do you mean by Q? Okay. So um, broadly speaking, I am interested in, and my PhD is in early Judaism. So very broadly speaking, I'm, I study a time period, which is sort of the Hellenistic and early Roman period of, of Judaism, which includes um, the earliest stages of Christianity. And of course, Jesus and the Jesus movement. But within that, my in my special interest is gender and women. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was interested in women in all kinds of early Jewish texts. Um, but when it came to studying Jesus and women, it gets pretty messy. As you know, as you've talked about on earlier versions of this podcast, it gets pretty messy when we start asking, how are we going to learn about Jesus? Where are we gonna draw the line in our evidence? There's all kinds of different evidence. And so I thought, I mean, ideally, as a historian, I like to think chronologically. And I like to go back as early as I can. Okay. So as you know, the Gospels might be about sort of ground zero of the Jesus movement. But they weren't the earliest texts. They're decades later. Some of them might be many decades later. Sure. And so I was just imagining, like, what would be the earliest layer? Well, the earliest Christian writings are Paul, but he's not that interested in Jesus, the, the man. Yes. He's interested in the concept of Christ and messianism. So it just hit me one day, you know what? The very, very earliest stuff we have that goes back to Jesus is probably some of his authentic sayings material. And that's what, in my mind, that's what Q is all about. It's about getting back to the earliest layer of material we have for what Jesus said. Um, but if I were teaching, if I were teaching like an undergraduate intro to New Testament class, and it, today was Q day, right? I would say um, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called synoptic because it means seen together. And why do we look at those together? Because there, something fishy is going on 
they're definitely related literarily and someone is copying from someone because right. they have they share an awful lot of material and so the that is called the synoptic problem how are they related and so um i know you know all this but i I'm, know that i'm, I'm imagining I'm just, I'm our just, i'm saying yes because i'm imagining how well this reinforces things that i try to teach my own students perfect perfect so the synoptic problem is that question of how those three gospels that look so much alike even though they have different aims are related and so one of the one of the main answers to the problem it's the one that i happen to to agree with but there are many others the one i agree with is called the two source hypothesis so the two that there were two sources that explain the overlapping material in Matthew and Luke. And so the sources are Mark and this lost, hypothesized list of Jesus quotes mm. that somebody set down at a very early time, remembered in some way and put to writing and it put to writing in Greek. And so Matthew and Luke have a bunch of Jesus actions, which they get from Mark, and then a bunch of Jesus words, which they get from what we call Q, which just uh, stands for Quelle, which is German for source. So it's just the saying source. Okay. So I decided, what if I were to take those, those shared words of Jesus used by Matthew and Luke, but not look at them in Matthew and Luke, look at them by themselves. Could I see, could anything rise to the surface that was core to what Jesus uh, said and taught that could teach me something about his attitudes to gender and to women. Well, that's exciting. I want to ask you more about that, but I first, I want to detour at the risk of losing a couple of um, our listeners, maybe helping them. So there's a, this group, of course, the Jesus Seminar, that has dedicated itself to studying these overlaps between Matthew and Luke. And they produced a critical edition of Q and I'm wondering, is that what you use when you go, what was in Q? Do you go to like that fortress? I guess that's also Fortress Press. Fortress, yeah. At the Hermeneia volume, critical edition of Q. Are you using that reconstruction of Q? Or are you looking just at Matthew and Luke? What's your text of Q? It, I actually d thought, yes, I'm going to use the Hermeneia critical edition um, and go with that because who am I? I'm not a text critic. I'm not, uh, I mean, I teach Greek, but I'm not a, it's not my, I'm not going to uncover something in Greek that other people haven't uncovered before me in 1500 years, put it that way. Right. So I decided I'm just going to go with the critical edition. But along the way, to my surprise, I started making little amendments to it here and there, thinking, um, the critical edition is too sparse. It's too minimalist. It has very strict rules about um, uh, something has to appear in Matthew and Luke or else basically, or else Jesus didn't say it or we can't prove that Jesus said it. So it's very minimal. But what I started to find after spending a lot of time with those few sayings in Q was that I started to gain kind of confidence about like, well, I think this bit of Luke doesn't sound like Luke made it up. It sounds like something Jesus of Nazareth would say based on everything we can kind of put together about him. So I made a few tweaks and it, it only makes sense that if there were a list of Jesus sayings, it would be bigger than the few that Ma both Matthew and Luke shared because we have the gospel of Mark and we see how Matthew and Luke used Mark. And if we didn't have the Gospel of Mark and had to put it together the way they did the critical edition of Q, we would have a much smaller Mark. We would lose everything that Luke omits from Mark. Yes. And so I imagine if we, if we allow that someone had set down Jesus' words, which makes lots of sense because he was popular for some reason, uh, yes, he was going around get, um, attracting people because he was a reputable healer and, you know, exorcist and miracle worker, but he also went around saying things and those things must have been compelling. And at his death, 
uh, it only makes sense that people thought we should remember what he said and, yeah. and set it down. It, it's just kind of, to me, it makes common sense that before there were the gospels, someone had a sayings collection. Um, so there are bits yeah. of Matthew and Luke that don't overlap and that don't come from Mark. And you had to make that choice at different times and say, you know, I think this part actually comes from Q. Yes, I did. Yeah. That's hard to do. Yeah. But let's, let's not forget that when we're dealing with the New Testament or in antiquity, dealing with antiquity in general, we're, we're using, we have to use our imagination and make some guesses. That's all, that's all we can do. We don't have anything 100% from antiquity. We can only do an educated best guess. And so that's what I did sometimes. For example, um, what I noticed in Q, I was looking for mentions of women. Was Jesus teaching women? Um, and what popped out at me from Q was something called, I call them gender parable pairs, or other people call them gender pairs, gender doublets. And what they are is, Everyone who reads the Bible has read these, but they may not notice that they're about gender. It's that Jesus has a habit of teaching the same story twice in two different ways. Once with a male example and the second time with a female example. So that, that's, that's what my, I haven't noticed that for sure. That's so. what my book is about. So for example, uh, a man loses a, a shepherd loses a sheep. He has a hundred, he loses one and he goes out and looks for it. He finds it and brings it back and rejoices. This is a story of Jesus. And then again, Jesus says, likewise, a woman loses a coin. She has 10 coins, she loses one. She sweeps the floor, she finds it, she rejoices. It's a gendered pair. And this happens a lot in, in Q, considering that Q is quite short. There are a number of these, six or seven of these gendered pairs. And they're like teaching stories that definitely on purpose are very parallel and teach the exact same lesson. They're verbally parallel. They have the same message, but one is about a male character and the other is about a female character or more kind of subtly, one is about something that men usually did at the time, such as fishing. And one is about something that women usually did at the time, such as uh, baking bread. Oh, okay. This so what, one of the things I added to Q was uh, the, the twin parables of the persistent widow and the persistent neighbor. Ah. Those didn't make it into the critical edition of Q, but I, following something I, I heard Schusler Fiorenza, Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza give a talk about, I thought, wait a minute, Luke puts a frame around these parables. There's a, a widow and she persistently annoys this judge saying, I need justice, I need justice. And finally at the end, the judge gives her justice, not because he um, is a nice guy, but because she's annoying. And then the second parable, which is the male version, is a neighbor has already gone to bed and he's, his, he's in bed with his sheep, children, animals, it says, and the neighbor comes banging on the door like, help, I've had a guest, I need food, I gotta serve my guest, help me, I need bread. And the neighbor's like, go away. But the guy keeps banging and banging on the door and finally the neighbor gives him some bread, not because he's in a good mood about it, but because he's being annoyed to death. And then Luke says, framing, the, framing these, is Luke talking about prayer. And Schusler Fiorenza said, that's, would Jesus teach that praying to God uh, is like bothering someone who's not nice? Mm. Because when Luke says that those, this is about praying, um, according to Schusler Fiorenza, it, it really takes a, if you look at the stories just alone, they're, they don't say anything about praying. They talk about persistence for justice and persistence for feeding others. It's quite a different message if you frame it talking about prayer. And so that's what flagged up for me. Oh my gosh, I think that, G I think that a lot of the stuff 
that because we're being so cautious, we say that's special Lucan material or, you know, this gospel author wrote this and that. I think much more of it could actually go back to Jesus than we think. And I pulled that gender pair into, into my cue. I find that very compelling. I have to say, I find that to be a really compelling argument for uh, expanding that. Thanks. I thought so too. Line. I mean, yeah. you have to notice those literary structuring patterns and then take them seriously. Did yes. We, you know, yeah. I, so I don't, I don't know where that will go, but I hope that that receives a good reception that has a good reception in uh, among the experts. Um, I hope so too. <laughs> let me, I want to return to a question about what you might have learned from noticing these, the fact that there are these gendered pairs uh, in the Q discourse. Um, but before that, I've heard you say a few times that you feel like Q takes us, the material that you're going to assign to Q or that we assign to Q takes us back closer to what Jesus said. And I wonder if you could say a few words that defend that claim that like we're getting closer to Jesus when we look at this Matthew Luke overlap. Yes. I, sh I should defend that claim because when scholars first came up with these two documentary, two document, two source hypothesis and um, it began to really take hold and it sort of became the consensus for how we solve the synoptic problem. Something happened that I, I call, uh, well, I don't know what to call it, but that pendulum of getting overexcited about something new and going a bit too far with the confidence mm -hmm. uh, that we use. So I think Q was used a bit too confidently in the past. People were convinced by the hypothesis, got excited and began talking about it. Same thing with historical Jesus research in general. There was a period when like the criteria of authenticity for, for historical Jesus stuff almost became like, um, like a mathematical equation that you're like, well, we got that right and now we know. So I, I do tend to think of Q material as early. Early. But I, but I don't assume that because something's in Q, it automatically is a better historical source or automatically must be exactly as Jesus said it or anything like that. But that said, I have chosen to, in my style of be a, being a historian, I do pay more attention to things that are earlier. Okay. Knowing that just because Q might be early, does not mean that it's it represents the only Jesus movement. You know, it's it is an early, a precious early resource for learning about Jesus. But it's not like we we dug up Jesus diary, and so we there know, you go. It would be fair to say we know at least that some people who are involved in the Jesus movement, who were writing down things before Matthew or Luke were writing down some things wrote down these things and represented Jesus, put forth their idea about what Jesus had to say. Exactly. You know, it's, it's another. Seriously as that, it's a representation of an early strata of the tradition. Exactly. Just like we're kind of lucky to have four gospels and lucky to have lots of letters of Paul and lucky to have a, like multiple early Christian sources. We're lucky to be able to conceive of some sayings material as possibly representing an, an earlier community than the ones in the Gospels. Can I ask, I, just, I don't want to be too, um, I don't want to get too caught up in the source critical sort uh, questions, but yeah. I'm curious about them. I remain curious about them. And one of the th uh, things that I know is, is that there are a whole group of scholars who work on Jesus and the Gospels who are very skeptical of Q. Oh and yes. Sometimes yeah. students or other uh, readers will encounter them, and they range from very conservative to pretty what we would think of as mainstream critical scholars. Yes, what absolutely. What do you say to scholars like that who are just want to toss out the Q hypothesis entirely? Yeah, I mean, I very deliberately say over and over in my book 
that you don't have to buy into the two source hypothesis to ha take a close look at these gendered pairings and use them to think about what was happening around Jesus and women and in, in early Jesus movements around women that this thing happened, um, which is not something common in, you know, Hellenistic Jewish literature. It seems to have been a rhetorical innovation of Jesus. Um, there, are, there are not very many times when teachers address women. Mm. When they do in antiquity, it is often to say something very different than what's being said to the men. Like Ovid has these uh, poems about love and one, one half is addressed to men and it's called How to Catch a Woman. The other half is addressed to women and it's called How to Please a Man. Mm -hmm. Those are two different lessons. Um, and s some of the New Testament texts have, you know, Paul, uh, well, the- Pseudo Paul. That's right, that's what I call them. So you know, women obey your husbands, husbands love your wives. It's often like, they often do decide in antiquity, let's address the ladies, but not with the same message. So whether or not you um, want to use Q as something to think about, you have to, when you're trying to get behind Jesus and early Jesus movements, you have to assume that some of the sayings material that we get in the New Testament is authentic. And many people assume that lengthy Greco-Roman style speeches in John are, don't ring true for something that a Galilean um, basically peasant would have said or wanted to say. Um, so how, if you're being a historian and you're trying to look through sayings material to see what Jesus was going around saying, forget about Q. But if you see sayings in both Matthew and Luke, who are writers with pretty different styles and aims, they've both got it in there. It's very logical to assume that saying came before them. Uh, and therefore, if not from the mouth of Jesus, it came from someone, a group or a person earlier, remembering Jesus at a bit of an earlier stage. It's still useful, so it doesn't it doesn't really matter. I I don't really do um, text criticism, or I, I don't work on the synoptic problem. I'm just one of the people who looks at Q as a text. And what's and I didn't mean to I didn't mean in my book to start fiddling with it, but it just happened. It have, you, you know you have to establish the text before you can read it, and. Uh, you know, so you you experienced that, and I yeah. it sounds like what you were aiming to do was make a contribution to thinking about how early Christian communities might have been different in their handling of gender ideology than Greco-Roman or even some rival Christian groups. I mean, there might have been divisions like between the pseudo-Pauline or Pauline communities yeah. and other communities that were associated with the Jesus movement. And so, what I, I think that that's obviously your real interest and contribution here. And so what did we, what did we notice? What's different about what, how um, gender is handled in the rhetoric of Jesus in Q than um, in Ovid or in Pseudo Paul? Yeah. Oh, that's like, that's the crux of the question that I was asking. So what I found was that the few people who do want to talk about these gender pairs, they, they haven't been talked about very much. Uh, down through history, uh, even though I think Eusebius noticed them, that they were gendered, but it hasn't been talked about that much. But among the people who do talk about them, and I won't mention their names, there are two camps. And the camps have to do with um, the role of women and, and feminism. So there's the one camp that looks at them and says, boom, Jesus was obviously a feminist. It's Case closed. Uh, the Bible says men and women are equal. It's all rosy. That's it. And then there's camp two that reacts against that and says, um, you know, no, the, the text of Q also has androcentric language. There are times when it talks only to brothers. Um, you know, the roles of the 
men and women are still totally gendered. Like the woman is in the kitchen sweeping to look for the coin. The man is the shepherd looking for the sheep. So therefore, nothing to see here. Move on. Not feminist, not egalitarian. So what yeah. I think the work of my book was, was to say to both camps, you're on to something. Let's make it all work. And I think I was able to do that by saying the people who are seeing gender leveling rhetoric are right. Nobody really did this kind of didactic stories that make sure to teach the same lesson with a male example and a female example. Nobody did that before. And Jesus of Nazareth, not a particularly tra rhetorically trained individual, he deserves credit for being a good teacher. He, he, it only makes sense that he was a good teacher. So he, he always drew from what was right around him in Galilee. Um, you know, the fauna and flora, the f fishing, the little cities that were right around the Galilee. These are the things he mentions. And if he teaches with a, like a peasant male example and a peasant female example, it tells me that there were women and men around him and he was wisely catering his teaching to both of them. But on a deeper level, he also was teaching them the same religious and spiritual lessons and assuming that they were both intellectually capable equally, regardless of gender, of ingesting the lessons and be responsible for acting on them. Like the, there's a little tiny gender pair that simply, you know, the couple of men are, are um, harvesting in the field. One is taken, another is left. Two women are grinding at the mill and one is taken, another is left. It's very short, but yeah. in it, we see that Jesus um, expected men and women to be responsible for what happens to them in the, at the eschaton, at the end of days. You know, at, at, apocalyptically speaking, gender does not get you in or out because one guy is left and one guy stays, one woman is left and one guy stays. It's it's incumbent upon the person, regardless of their gender, to be a fully religious, intellectual, spiritual person. But the other camp that said, you know, these are still androcentric, they were right. The, the, the egalitarianism of the sayings says men and women are both um, important recipients of my message, but it does not disrupt Jesus' words do not disrupt gender norms of the day. They, they, use, they use them. They participate easily in them and don't try to turn them on their heads. So Jesus is not a 21st century feminist saying like, you know, gender doesn't exist and... Women should you know, go fishing and men should bake bread. Exactly. It, that's not part of the message. And we may theologically, feminist theologians may want to go and say this extrapolates to mean that we, we have to challenge gender stereotypes and norms, but it, it's not something that appears in the sayings of Jesus. And that's what those sort of naysayer scholars were saying. So I found this middle path that was like a yes and no, but the, I, the most important thing, in my opinion about the book, was that everyone who studies Jesus and women almost everyone who studies Jesus and women comes from a standpoint where Christianity is somehow important to them, whether they're inside of it or they're in a culture that's Christian or they're reacting against it. They, they see Jesus as a really important pivotal figure. And if they're wanting to say, wow, Jesus of Nazareth was, was an egalitarian, was a, a feminist, was whatever they're trying to say he was, they often neglect to go back before him. And what happens, whether accidental or not, is a kind of anti-Judaism that comes from not asking questions about other Jews, seeing something great about Jesus, and then saying, unlike Judaism, Jesus did this. And historically speaking, it's not what I, what I said in my book by using earlier literature and Hellenistic Judaism and stuff that came before Jesus, what I said was that Judaism before Jesus 
and the Greco-Roman world before Jesus was experiencing a kind of blossoming where all kinds of things were happening for women. They were, we have evidence that they initiated divorce, owned property, uh, were business people, got involved in politics, commissioned text, you know, were important patrons, were religious leaders, synagogue um, leaders in Hellenistic Judaism, according to lots and lots of inscriptions, thanks to Bernadette Bruton and um, Ross Kramer, who cataloged all these inscriptions. So yes, G I say in my book, Jesus had an innovative rhetoric of gender, and it treated men and women as intellectual and religious equals, but he was not the first man on earth to do that. And he certainly wasn't doing it because he was coming out of Judaism or against Judaism. He was able to do it from within Judaism as many other Jews were doing. So, so he was a person who, who, whose teaching was perhaps really sensitive to his audience, but his uh, implicate the implication of uh, intellectual or spiritual equality between men and women didn't disrupt gender roles, nor did it innovate beyond sort of a zeitgeist or something that was going on in his time of, of a blossoming. I'm curious to know more about what you found with the, the blossoming of the women, sort of, it sounds like a kind of first century women's liberation movement that um, you're talking about, but maybe I'm exaggerating what I just heard you say. No, a lot of scholars of gender in antiquity do talk about this kind of, in, during the late Republic, there was kind of a a whole host of new roles that women could step into, both in inside Judaism and outside Judaism. Um, Alicia Batten has talked about it. Maybe Kathleen Corley is someone who has talked about it. Um, and then generally scholars of, of gender in the New Testament talk about a decline mm. that began in the first century uh, and that we can see even within the texts of the New Testament, but also extra canonical texts, that the, Jesus and Paul say in Romans, when he's listing all these women, patrons, apostles, co-workers, teachers, um, they, they're at an early stage of Christianity, but they're at the tail end of this blossoming. But this, this kind of clamping down on women's roles began with Augustus, he did a lot of work to control family, what, what is a Roman woman, um, what's okay to do morally, and he, um, like everything to do with kind of adultery, childbearing, um, women's public appearances, he made a lot of rules that start, I, in my opinion, he started a snowball effect towards uh, a kind of reversal of freedom for women that the second century, in, by the second century, end of the second century, it's kind of terrible for women. Yeah. So, oh, this is fascinating. Um, well, you know, I've got, you got me thinking that through the Q materials, we're able to almost see through Jesus's eyes to a group of students that are sitting around him. Um, yes. And then we can also picture a, a community that valued the sayings and teachings that they preserved out of those contexts as being a pretty egalitarian community, at least in its membership, if not in the roles that people played. Um, yeah. But, but it's coming at the tail end of, or, you know, the, there's a reactionary backlash building yeah. in those cultures. Um, yes, yeah. I'm kind of wondering, I don't know if this is a smooth transition or not, like how you, um, what you might have to say about where Thomas fits into this picture of um, gender rhetoric in Jesus sayings. I'm thinking about sayings in Thomas um, where Mary is treated as a disciple and the other brother, the other disciples want to repress her role and then Jesus says problematically that don't she, worry I'll I'll make her male I'll make her male and then yeah. she's like one of us so and where do you think those kinds of traditions fit in all these patterns um they those texts and there are other texts too that give us hints that Mary Magdalene was a lot more important at some point but that that tradition was suppressed and she gets morphed into a prostitute uh, incorrectly. And uh, those texts are useful for teaching, probably not 
they probably don't teach us much about the historical Jesus because what has come down to us is later, but they do teach us that there was a wide diversity before, you know, canons were closed and orthodoxy was figured out. There were all kinds of people somehow connected to a Jesus movement uh, doing very different things. And gender is one of the ways, gender is one of the lenses that you can look across the second, third, and fourth century material and see uh, uh, major friction and, um, and conflict. Um, it, in fact, in my view, when it comes to Paul, there were two pseudo-Pauls. And one of them won and made it into the canon. And that was the one that was not great for women. And, but there was another pseudo Paul that continued thinking with Paul, like the more of the Thecla tradition that took Paul's asceticism. We don't think of Paul, or generally people don't think of Paul as kind of not a big fan of marriage. But I do. That's how I think of him. But yeah, he was like, if you have to, go ahead. But try not to like me so some some of the reception of paul took that on very seriously and and we see christian ascetics which was a way for women to flourish because they if you're an ascetic you don't have sex um you're freed from constantly being pregnant losing children um caring for the children um you know following a, a man's lead suddenly you're a free agent and so there was another pseudo Paul that didn't win the test of time, didn't make it, that followed his ascetic instincts toward kind of, in a way, freedom that, that was attractive to some women. But the, the little bit in Thomas about the disciples being kind of like, why is he telling Mary all this stuff? It definitely shows us that there were traditions that that honored Mary as one of their their saint or their like main teacher. There were was Peter, Paul, and Mary. Yeah. And they they go in different directions, but the Mary tradition kind of gets pushed out. But it if nothing else, it shows us there was some tension around Mary. Right. Yeah. Okay. So now you've got me thinking um you're talking about that sort of path of the ascetic or the renunciate as a liberating path for women. And we certainly see that in the Thecla story um, and, and some, some other apocryphal apostolic apocrypha too. But um, what I, what I'm thinking about now is this material that I think is from it. Well, it's either from Q or from Mark where the disciples say to Jesus, Lord, we've left all these things. We've left our wives. We've left our jobs. We've left our homes and things to follow you. Are we thinking maybe that um, that's sort of closes off the view of women who also took those same paths and left husbands and families and houses to follow Jesus? Or should we think of a different kind of structure among I, the, I don't the think followers it of Jesus? I don't think it closes off the view because we see in the New Testament other examples just kind of thrown out on the way by talking about Mary Magdalene being saying, you know, she provided for him out of her own resources and traveled around with traveled around with him. Right. So and the all the resurrection scenes seem to imply or the crucifixion scenes seem to imply that the core group had a lot of women because uh, the core men ran away, fair enough, as they would probably be next, uh, next one to be crucified if they um, caused any trouble. But yeah. the, the witnesses around the crucifixion are all these named women who, it, different in each gospel, but it shows that there was an idea that, yes, of course, a bunch of women were in that group. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, apostles? Women apostles? Well, we have Junia. Paul definitely uses the word apostle of Junia. Yeah. It was it was Bernadette Bruton who wrote the, the article that ended up getting the, you know, the Greek text of the New Testament reverted back to Junia. Because for a long time, there was, I mean, since antiquity, there was a, oh, uh, 
this must be a misspelling or a guy with a girl's name or uh and as, know, and as thanks a woman but it as, was and as a thanks for her labors bruton's work doesn't get cited as much as it should so it's even spawned a the Bruton effect that people talk about? Yes, the Bruton phenomenon. My, my proudest coinage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you might want to talk about that a little bit then, the politics of citation. You kind of landed there. Yes. I will pull out another book. Okay. Gender in, and Second Temple Judaism, just out, also from Fortress Lexington. Uh, which is an edited volume by Kathy Ehrensberger and Shana Scheinfeld. And Br the Bruton Phenomenon article is reprinted in there. Fantastic. Um, but it's also open access and Bible and critical theory. And what it says is that there's, a, there's an invisible wall where work about women and gender or work by women and gender doesn't push through and become a, you know, required reading or important reading. It's always seen as a niche. You'll get a textbook. It will have one chapter on women and gender. Won't be mentioned in the rest of the textbook. You'll teach a class. You'll have one week on women and gender. But what my article says is that it actually isn't good scholarship. Like what, what has happened to Bruton, whose 1984 book, women leaders in the ancient synagogue is still not, why do we not talk about the fact that there were women leaders? Maybe not in the Jerusalem temple, but I mean, Judaism is diverse and some of the kinds of Judaism definitely had female elders, synagogue heads, priestesses, all these inscriptions tell us that that was going on. And yet our students don't learn that. Our students also know that Junia is in Romans 16, but they don't know that Bernadette Bruton did that work of making that um, Greek text really making that to... argument that the, that the texts, the best texts that we have support the reading of Junia. That, there, that, yes. That Junia yeah. is a female name. Yeah, the oldest manuscripts. And the oldest manuscripts and that Paul unashamedly refers to her as an apostle. Yeah. Yeah, just in his list of people he's trying to not forget to greet and thank. Which is, that's so important. Well, thank you for, <laughs> thank you for bringing that up. I mean, I'm glad that we got a chance to talk about that as well. Um, Sarah, we've actually been talking for about 45 minutes or so, and I think that okay. probably- Okay, I hear ya. We should probably bring this awesome conversation to a close. I really appreciate your time today and sharing your expertise and passion. Um, this has been an enlightening conversation for me and I hope for my students as well. Well, thank you so much. It's a great idea in these pandemic times to just make this available, open access on YouTube. It's, it's wonderful. Everyone who's teaching is very happy to get uh, solid scholarly, yet accessible online free resources. So you're doing everyone a favor. It's just wonderful. That is the goal. I really hope people will appreciate this, um, getting a chance to hear from you. Uh, you're doing incredible things and I can't wait to read your book. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you, Sarah, bye-bye. Take care.